Thank you all so much for coming over. <laughs> of course, this is so nice. You know, I actually walked here all the way from Brooklyn because it's so beautiful today. Oh, yeah, New York is gorgeous in the spring. Spring is officially sprung. <laughs> Winter is coming. Who's your new friend again, Seth? This is John, and John actually think winter is over and we're headed into spring now. Winter is coming. Okay. The snow will fall a hundred feet deep. The ice wind will howl out the north, and the sun hides its face for years, and little children will all be born and die in the darkness. <laughs> so much for global warming. Huh? <laughs> all right, let's go, 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 go! Welcome to Cord Killers, the show that reports from the front lines of the cord cutting revolution so that you can watch what you want, whenever you want, anywhere, and on any device you choose. As I quoted from the YouTube creator email that went out earlier this week, I'm Tom Shadowing. Merritt. <laughs> hey, beautiful people. I'm Brian Brushwood uh, on vacation slash assignment in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. And uh, holy cow, man. Uh, thank you to everybody showing up. We're actually doing this week's episode early on account of my nutty, nutty schedule. Thank you to Bryce, uh, our engineer, showing up in the studio. And thank you to all the fine people in the chat room. Yeah, thanks, everybody, uh, for being flexible. It's funny. I was putting out on Twitter as much info as I can for the people who like to watch live. And, of course, the people who get it on demand are just going to be surprised they'll get it a little earlier than usual. There was one guy who's like, dude, it's a podcast. Who cares when you record it? I'm like, all right. That's still <laughs> You're like, touche, sir. Uh, yeah. By the way, people are asking if this is a real vacation or a quote-unquote vacation vacation. Uh, this is a air quotes vacation. Mm -hmm. I'm staying at the uh, Rio All Suites Hotel. Look, they put me in a uh, suite. Uh, and when I say they, I mean my uh, vacation travel agent because Your I just really daddy? love to be. Wait, no. That's uh, I'm hoping to go to the Penn and Teller Theater. Wouldn't that be interesting if oh, there was yeah, some there reason Vegas, for me to go there? Right? Penn's yeah, lost yeah. A, 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 a ton of weight. There was a big article about like how he did it and everything. I saw on Hacker News earlier this week. Heck yeah, dude. Uh, Ray Cronice is uh, it's like a cryothermic. Uh, yeah, I yeah. It's pretty yeah. cool. Well, uh, enough about that. Let's get to the primary target. Heck yeah. Because the big news this week is HBO. Remember, Brian, remember mm. back when, when yeah. we used to sit here and go, huh, when's HBO going to finally wake up and make it available in the United States for people to pay without having to have a cable TV subscription? Well, I give you no less than three ways that they have done so this week. HBO Now is available through Apple TV. HBO Now is available through Cablevision, and HBO is available through Sling TV. All of them charge you $15 a month uh, on the Apple TV version. You can watch online and on your iOS devices, including your Apple TV. Uh, so you can sign up uh, through your app, or you can sign up through the iTunes store. Uh, it's pretty much identical to HBO Go. A lot of people say that it seems to work faster than HBO Go for them. I couldn't really tell a difference myself. Then HBO on Sling TV is one linear channel that you can actually watch live, which you don't get with HBO Now, and an on-demand library of TV and movies. So you don't get HBO Go. You get this really hard-to-use strip that has everything in their library that you have to endlessly scroll through if you want to watch something, or you can Hold search, I guess. Hold on. Now, now, why? Okay, uh, first of all, this really surprises me because I fully expected whatever they're online offering. And first of all, $15 is a fine, fine price for that. I think that's a great idea. I think it's good that they're doing it. Do you remember it. us saying, like, how much would you pay in theory if they ever knew we were like, oh, $20, $40, $15. $15 yeah. is what they charge everybody Let, without less, discounts or specials. Right, less or about what you would pay if you had traditional cable. And I think that's smart. Uh, however, I just assumed that whatever it is would be essentially just HBO Go because I, I don't know that there's a big benefit to watching stuff live. I suppose like HBO has a presence in the boxing space, right? You know, occasionally there'll be a big fight that they'll do live, but outside of that, no, well, you, know, you know, it's like I have found that watch? sometimes I prefer to just put on an HBO channel rather than decide, right? That moment of decision, and Netflix users know this very well, will sometimes prevent you from watching something. Because you'll sit there weighing your options. Whereas if you just turn on HBO and X-Men Last Stand is on, you might just watch it. You might Fair just enough. be like, all right, fine. So I get that. And Sling TV, don't forget, has everything on demand too. What is annoying is they don't have it in the HBO Go interface. So uh, so what's different about it? I mean, just basically, I, uh, first of all, explain to me, give me a reason why they wouldn't just give everyone an HBO Go account. Is there some thinking behind this? 
Maybe it's HBO wants you to pay a little more for the channel if you do that. I don't know. Maybe it's Sling saying we want to keep people in the Sling app. We don't want them going elsewhere. But then they, you can log in to watch ESPN. My guess is they just couldn't negotiate the agreement with HBO to allow that for some reason. Uh, and, and that is not unusual, right? Cable companies in the past often did have problems negotiating with HBO Go over which apps they would allow people to use and that. Uh, but yeah, there's no advantage to it. it. It just makes it more difficult to find your HBO shows. They're all there. You can do everything you can do in HBO now with Sling TV. It's just not as good of an interface. So, man, I guess I just... And you can actually do the one more thing, right? You can live stream. So you give up the interface in exchange for the live stream, which I agree with you. That's It's nice to have the live stream sometimes, but I don't think it's that worth it. Yeah, that seems like a poor trade. Um uh, I, I, I don't know, especially for HBO has been astonishingly savvy over the last five years. It's like they understood that they had a pent up demand. They did a great job of playing up the fact, uh, you know, playing coy, saying, oh, look at us. We're the most pirated content ever in the history of blank. Uh, all of this stuff was very, very smart. This seems like an unsmart move. This feels to me like uh, like some legacy behind the scenes stuff that they just decided, like, well, I guess we're going to release this crappily in this way. And uh, I don't know. That surprises me. Uh, yeah, it is surprising because when you – okay, for one thing, Sling TV allows you to watch HBO on three different versions of your Sling TV login at once, which they don't allow you to do on any other channel. So they had to give HBO that, apparently. Then you look at HBO Now, and you see – this beautiful app. It's very much like HBO Go. It's not that different, but it works great. And you're like, yes, this is exactly what I want. In fact, if you slap a linear channel in there, I would pay for that way before I would add HBO to Sling TV. And frankly, I'm not going to pay. I, I did it to see what it was like and tested it out, but I am not going to pay any extra for HBO on Sling TV. I'm just going to pay for HBO now. Yeah, I got to admit, uh, I thought that HBO coming to Sling TV would have been like the slam dunk where it's like, now I'm canceling cable, let's just do it and, and I'm done. However, um, there's the confounding effect of, the, uh, of my daughters love watching the Disney Channel on their iPhones, uh, which is easy because it authenticates with, uh, with the, the cable subscription we have. Nobody really watches cable on the television, uh, but everybody watches it on their, on their device. And I guess, I guess just hearing how kludgy HBO Now is, and this is not a smart decision financially. I think I'm wasting a lot of money by doing it, but it's just easier for me to keep stupid cable uh, just a little bit longer and then, you know, have the kids be able to watch their Disney and then me be able to use, you know, HBO Go. You know, Watch Disney is supposed to be compatible with Sling TV, although I don't think they have activated it yet. Uh, but that they when they launched it, they said, yes, we're, uh, you can log in to watch ESPN right now, and we, you'll be able to log in to watch Disney. So you might check and see if that has actually launched. I'm not aware whether it's actually launched or not. Because if that's your big objection, then I would just do HBO Now and Sling TV. Done. Yeah, but does HBO Now suck or not? Like, HBO like, Now like is it's... great. Let's not, let's not make any mistakes here. Sling TV's HBO implementation is sufficient. If you don't want to get cable, it will get you everything. You'll be able to watch it live, and you'll be able to watch it on demand. If all you want to do is watch the most recent Game of Thrones, you search, you type in Game of Thrones, it shows up. It's going to take you just a little longer to get there. However, okay. if you have an Apple TV, I would highly recommend using HBO Now instead because it's just a much better interface. So and it's the answer, same price. Answer me this, and actually I want to rope in our, our fantabulous uh, producer, uh, Bryce Castillo, because sure. he apparently has been hands-on with it as well. Um, all things being equal. If you had somebody else's HBO Go login, which again, HBO in their brilliance has been played coy and said, we don't mind if you use your friend's HBO Go account, um, or HBO Now, all things being equal, which would you log into right now? Bryce? Oh, uh, uh, go over Bo now? Both of you guys, yeah. Uh, I've never had Go, but I really do enjoy using Now. It makes sense on Apple TV. It works just like yeah. you would like a Hulu or a Netflix. The only reasons you would log into Go are A, you didn't want to pay for HBO now and you were using someone else's login, or B, you didn't own an Apple TV and you wanted to be able to watch it on a Roku or an Xbox or something like that. Right on. Okay. Well, good. Maybe maybe it is time to cancel cable again. 
Yeah, and and I would check out that Watch Disney thing because then your daughters can log into their Watch Disney apps just the way they did. You just had to pay the five dollars for the uh, Sling Kids Pack. That's all. Sure. No. Down. Right. I'm in. Let's do it. Let's also thank our patrons, the folks who make this show possible. Uh, you are amazing. Patreon.com slash cord killers if you want to find out uh, all about that. But essentially, all we say is if you've got a dollar uh, extra laying around that you can afford to give to us to help make the show, we will accept it. Well, well, here, uh, it's value for value. What, if you, if you get something out of the show, if you find the show valuable and you can afford to give that value back, that's what we're about. That's what makes it possible for us to do this show. So there's a bunch of people who are on the fence where it's like, well, I'm not really a joiner. Like, I enjoy listening or whatever. But it's like I'm not going to join your cult or whatever. We're not asking you to join our cult. But here's the thing. If you met us in person, would you buy us a beer? That's $5. $5. Just pledge $0.10 cents per episode. That's $5 per year you're going to end up spending. You bought us basically one beer that we split. Me and Tom sitting side by side, taking a sip of a Guinness and then handing it back and forth. That is uh, an important thing. And you can make it possible by heading over to patreon.com slash cord killers. Buy us a beer that won't even hurt our livers. Patreon.com slash cord killers. Let's look at Signals Intelligence. Heck yeah. Guinness won't hurt your liver either, I hear. Uh, YouTube sent creators an email that I quoted earlier in the show. I mean, they literally said... Uh, your fans want choices. Not only do they want to watch what they want whenever they want, anywhere and on any device they choose, they want YouTube features built specifically. So, I don't know, Brian. Tough, tough. Look, I, I, I'm not going to say we caused this wave, but I am going to say we saw this wave coming four years ago. And we have figured out, apparently, the exact right phrasing that is genuinely... I've never, we've never, we've never... I, I've never generated a meme that had this much, you know, world... <laughs> flow to it that's amazing yeah whether it's convergent evolution simultaneous thought discovery i don't know but i like to think we're a part of it in some way and definitely in a very early way anyway the reason that they were sending this email is they're getting their creators to sign new terms of service for a subscription service what you'll be able to do eventually is pay youtube a monthly fee to have ads removed uh and the creators have to agree to do this if they want to continue to make money. So up till now, the only way to make money through YouTube was either through donations or commercials. Uh, and what YouTube is saying is, look, you can still make money through commercials, but you have to allow us to put you in the subscription plan, which removes the commercials, because if somebody's paying for the service, they don't want some people to have commercials and some people not. Paying for the service should take commercials off the entire site. Uh, so it's an all or nothing thing for the creators, but you then will be able to watch YouTube without commercials. We don't know how much it's going to be. Uh, the rumors out there is somewhere around $10. Uh, and it would also give creators a 45% split of the revenue as they base it on time spent viewing, which I found in interesting, uh, and the ability to put some videos behind a paywall, which may be bad for viewers if a bunch of YouTube creators suddenly decided to like make you have to pay for the subscription to watch stuff. So I don't know, yeah. Brian. I mean, we both have responses to this as creators and I think there is a different response to be had as a viewer. So let's start with the viewer side of it. Well, okay. Starting with the viewer side of things, uh, it's a little bit weird because um, there's there's a kind of a two front war happening. If you're somebody who hates ads, then you can already eliminate ninety nine percent of all the advertising you'll see on YouTube by just getting AdBlock Pro. Right? It, it it'll cut out those ads at the beginning. The pre roll you won't ever see it. Uh, however, it will not, uh, the second front of the war is YouTube appears to be aggressively trying to shut down direct sponsorships, right? So it's like, we've got, uh, we've got, uh, and I, I it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out with scam school, but you know, domain.com has pre-bought ads all the way through, uh, next year. And so we do our best to make them entertaining vignettes. And there are a number of people that tell us it's their favorite part of the entire show because it, it, they were basically little but comedy those are skits that we put within in the, the show, right? We're talking about the pre-roll ads. Correct. Correct. So, so that's, in, that's an interesting part of it is that as a viewer, I may still see those in show ads. Well, and, and plus also, like, if you're somebody 
here's right now there's no expectation of not having ads there are some people who are like there are too many ads i don't like how many ads there are on the older episodes for the newer episodes where we're making them comedy skits people really seem to dig them a lot and they're like thanks domain.com for making this possible however Everything's going to change. Once somebody spends $10 with the expectation of I don't see ads anymore, all of a sudden YouTube isn't going to get the brunt of their frustrations. Me, Brian Brushwood, is going to get the frustrated comments where people are like, hey, man, I pay $10 a month so I don't have to see ads. What's this What's this domain.com rap video that I'm looking at? And when I say, well, the rap video was actually Brant's idea and you know, I'm not a very good rapper. And I <laughs> you just deflected on a brand. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, but I, I, I don't know. It's, it's interesting because YouTube is sort of moving in to Patreon's territory. And, of course, for full disclosure, of course, we love the fact that we're directly supported by fine folks like you. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, real quick, let's talk about the, uh, the, the time viewed as the metric as opposed to number of views. Uh, I think that's very, very smart. Uh, YouTube has always made a big push on their metric as far as like number of minutes viewed total and uh, which of your videos, you know, uh, you know, are, are, are being seen for what amount of time. It forces people to not upload giant swaths of garbage. It keeps them from doing, you know, three second videos that they know will get, you know, like vines basically that'll get a bunch of views but not go anywhere. It, I, I think as far as metrics that gauge actual engagement with the audience, I think number of viewer minutes per episode or whatever is a pretty fair way to divvy up that pie. What do you yeah, think? I, I think so too. I, and, and as a, somebody who does an hour long show, uh, yes, please rate time spent <laughs> view. Uh, hopefully we keep people watching all the way through. Uh, I also, as W. Scott S. One uh, pointed out, uh, always have to disclose that my wife works for YouTube uh, and she works with YouTube creators directly. So don't believe any of my opinions uh, about any of this because. Yes, well, and the, I'll disclose that I am, you know, obviously I have an interest because, you know, I'm, I, Scam School is one of the top, uh, what, tw uh, I think it's uh, number. Well, uh, I also have an interest myself because Cord Killers is on YouTube because Daily Tech News Show is on YouTube. But I have an extra, uh, <laughs> I have an extra thing there in that the lunch I ate today at Ronnie's Diner was paid for in part by YouTube. But that sure. disclosed, uh, I think this is a necessary move for YouTube. They're looking at Vessel out there. Vessel's saying $3 a month uh, with ads, okay? And, and, and top creators. YouTube is being very smart. They're going around to all of their top creators and they're whining and dining them and, and trying to make as many of them happy as possible. Uh, and I think it's very interesting that we have not seen anyone blow up out there. No big creators yet have said, what? The subscription thing is awful, right? And everything that YouTube does usually has a big backlash. So I'm still waiting for that. But I think it's interesting that we haven't seen it yet. What they're doing here is saying, look, we have a subscription service, but unlike Vessel, when you pay for your subscription service at YouTube, you don't get ads. Vessel makes you pay, and they still show you ads, right? It's the Netflix versus Hulu argument. And right. then they say to the creators, look, you haven't been making enough money. We all know that. Here's a way where we think we can increase the money. Now, you may not believe them, but it's trying to solve two problems at once. It's heading off the competition and trying to make their creators happy. Here's the other thing it does is, and this is probably the most valuable aspect to you, YouTube, is that it clearly identifies their core audience. So right now, like YouTube's uh, reach is so ubiquitous, it's used by so many people, it's difficult. How would you go about targeting? I mean, I assume they have they have metrics on the inside about you know like you know well this guy watches a lot, and of course they get demographic information. But at the end of the day, now they have a line, and they're they're able to say like, are you the kind of consumer of this media that's willing to shell out hard money, all of a sudden this isolates the single most valuable demographic in all of YouTube, which uh, I, I would imagine, I, I, I don't know what that means in terms of, I wouldn't be surprised if a follow-up effect of what they're doing now is three years from now, content creators are told in an email, hey, how would you like to reach the single most valuable 80,000 subscribers in all of YouTube. These are the ones who actually are spending the money to do X, Y, and Z, and you can reach them directly with your offers and your advertisements uh, and your targeted whatevers. I don't know. Yeah, it's possible. I, I think two more things. Uh, one is, if you want to get really wonky, YouTube has an inventory problem. 
uh, their their CPMs are so low in part because they have way too much inventory. They don't have as much inventory as television, uh, but they have more inventory than people are interested in right now. Yeah. Uh, so you suddenly take some inventory out of that. It doesn't hurt them. Putting up right. a subscription usually is resisted by ad sales because ad sales is like, hey, you're taking inventory away for us to sell. YouTube can afford to do that. And that could help raise CPMs for creators right there just by restricting the market. But point two is I don't think this is going to work. I don't see that many people paying for this I, any more than I saw people paying for Vessel. It doesn't matter whether it's commercials or not. Now, I may be wrong. I was surprised how many emails we got at Daily Tech News Show from people saying, I would definitely do this because when my daughter plays with my iPad and uses the YouTube app, there's always these inappropriate ads that play before kids' content, and I would love to pay to get rid of the ads so that I didn't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, that's uh well. First of all, I, I definitely relate to those parents because I'm definitely in that place, and we've we've covered stories before about um, you know the curation of kid friendly content, and YouTube has a problem in that you know you are just as likely to come across a filthy uh, My Little Pony parody as you are <laughs> to find a bootlegged My Little Pony you know uh, uh, episode. Um, yeah, man, I, 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 it'll be interesting to see what they do. I, obviously, something's got to change. Uh, they do have to grow. Yes, content creators on YouTube are uh, practically criminally underpaid. And I'm not saying that, that this is anyone's fault or that they should, you know, see, magically force CPMs to be higher than they are right now. But, uh, but, like, I mean, the way we look back on the contracts that Humphrey Bogart, you know, uh, signed in the early days of Hollywood, where he had to buy his own suits, you know, to to appear his own costumes for his own uh, for the movies he did, uh, seems horrific and strange to us. That is how we will feel about content creators' agreements with YouTube in Hank another decade Green or so. Is the Humphrey Bogart of his generation? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. No, of, of yeah. this generation, of my generation, of right now. Yes, it's happening. And, and you know, I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what changes. And I'm glad to see experimentation and tinkering. I'm glad that YouTube recognizes they have a problem. They're at least trying something. I think it's not enough. And I think they got to make bigger changes than they're doing. But, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Let's gear up while we wait to see where it goes. Heck yeah. Got some gear that uh, folks in Europe have had for a while, but it's coming to the U.S. and Canada now. The Xbox One is getting an over-the-air tuner for the U.S. version. It will come to everyone in a few months for $60, but if you're part of the Xbox One preview program, you can pay an extra $20. Uh, it's $80 right now. The Halpage Win TV 955Q TV tuner will now work with the Xbox One. Uh, you do need to provide your own antenna. It will then pipe over-the-air signals into your Xbox. You can take advantage of the one guide overlay. You can pause the live signal for up to 30 minutes and you can stream what is on your Xbox to your smart glass apps on Windows, iOS, and Android. Now we got an email from Dustin who is very excited to say this is going to rip apart TiVo and Channel Master because you don't have to pay a $15 a month fee, which you don't on Channel Master either. Uh, and it's uh, it, it, TiVo has slow and outdated apps and the Xbox apps are greater, which is true. The only thing Dustin missed is there's no DVR functionality for the Halpage over-the-air tuner on the Xbox One. That seems like a huge deal. And and can you give an explanation for why they wouldn't do that? I mean, My is guess, it a licensing is issue? Is totally it's certainly not a technology guess. issue. My guess is that they want to reserve that hard drive space for games and apps. Uh, yeah. And you... Definitely fill up hard drive space really fast when you use it as a DVR. You want to dedicate a hard drive to a DVR. I would like to see them allow you to plug in a USB drive and say, dedicate that to my DVR. They just haven't got to the point where they can work on that part of the code and make it happen because it's not a priority. That's my guess. Uh, all right. Well, in the meantime, like, again, uh, the marketing game is a weird one because it's like it's almost more important that you be able to say you can do a thing than necessarily how good or effective or useful it is. This is a significant checkbox. You know, from the beginning, Xbox One has you know to their detriment, they focused on the the TV integration and the live. You know, being able to watch a TV show while you're playing the game. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's good that they're doing this. It's good that they're building it in. I, I don't know that it's worth the money or that I would ever use. Or In fact, 
let me do this. Let me turn it around and say somewhere out there is somebody besides Dustin who is like super jazzed about this exact development and has a very clear idea of how they're going to use it. Do us a favor. Write us at uh, cordkillers at gmail.com and, ex- and make me as excited as you are. Fictitious Please. person. Yeah, absolutely. Because I agree with you. Like, I get excited at like, ooh, new functionality, added functionality. But then I have a TiVo and I'm like, well, why would I go to something where I can't? save things. I can run my TiVo through my Xbox One. It's what I do. So sure. that works better. I don't need this yet. But but I want to hear from that person too. Uh, real quickly, uh, we support ourselves in other ways besides your wonderful support of Cord Killers. One of the ways I do it is uh, writing novels. Uh, I do it for fun. So I think I've got them to a readable state. And if you would like to try them out, you can get a free version or you can pay to get an ebook version in your favorite e-reader of my latest one, Citadel 32 Tales of the Aggregate. It is about uh, a moon base that is cut off from Earth after a sort of apocalyptic event happens down on Earth. And while Earth tries to rebuild and figure out how to reconnect with the moon, folks up on the moon have to figure out how to get along. Uh, and that's what the story is about. So if you are interested in that, Citadel 32, available at TomMerrittBooks.com. Can I, can I confess something to you, Tom? Uh, I am deeply intimidated. Like, I feel like there are certain categories that, I, that I'm qualified. There are certain games I'm qualified to play. I feel like I'm well qualified to, you know, variety entertainment. I'm able to do magic tricks and perform on stage. Podcasting, punditry, I feel like I have a few opinions and I feel like I'm able to play this space. I am deeply, deeply intimidated by the idea of writing any kind of fiction. And I, I don't know that I've told you this, but like I am deeply impressed that you that you do it. I mean, it's like like you do a thing that I'm terrified and of and and don't believe I could ever do. And I don't know that I've ever told you how oh, well, impressed thanks, I am by that. Uh, frankly, I am terrified of it too. <laughs> but see, that's uh, but the I've been pounding away it. at it for years, uh, and I've got a great uh, friend who's an editor uh, that works with me on them. Uh, but thank you. No, I really appreciate you saying that. I am ridiculously awed by, you know, I don't want to turn this into too much of a mutual admiration thing, but I feel the same <laughs> way about you and magic. Like, I could never do any of that. It is incredibly Although, I would pay money to see you try. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I just we want sh- to send you out on stage with a torch and just see you get through this fire-eating act. <laughs> we, should, we should do it. It would be embarrassingly hilarious. Uh, in the meantime, let's move on to the front lines. I would totally do that. Front lines! The first TVs to be officially pronounced Netflix recommended are LG's 4K UHD TVs with WebOS 2.0, all of Sony's Android TVs, and the Roku sets from Hisense, Insignia, and TCL. Now, does the ability to turn on your TV and have it launch Netflix at the push of one button appeal to you, Brian? So here's the thing. Uh, My question is, who's the bigger winner here? Is this uh, is the win? I assume that on the surface, the reason they worked out this deal is that the winner is LG because they get the blessing of Netflix. But it seems to me like the real winner is Netflix because they're now positioned in a place where it's like their legitimacy is so strong that they're able to point to a TV and say, "Buy this TV because we say so." That's that's huge. If people follow it, I mean, it's LG and Sony TVs. They're not horrible. They aren't necessarily often held up as the leading brands, especially because I'm talking Sony Android TVs, which are a new spin on that. But they're not bad TVs in in any sense. And these Roku TVs are like a double threat. It's Roku saying like, hey, we approve of this. And guess what? Our friends at Netflix do too. Yep. Lionsgate has a deal with Comic-Con International to create a subscription video on-demand service featuring original content and movies from Lionsgate and Partner Studios. The question is, Tom, uh, like, are, are you finally, are you chomping at the bit for to finally get Geek TV? Uh, let me see what's in it. Like, Lionsgate has some amazing stuff. They could fill it up with some great things. Working with Comic-Con, they could have some, like, panels and things in there that I'd be really interested in. Price it effectively. Yeah, I might add this to my portfolio. It's all in the details for me. This is kind of like an echo of the exact same question. Who's the bigger winner? Is it Comic-Con for the having their legitimacy being crowned by, by this agreement? Or is it Lionsgate because they were able to name, n- nab Comic-Con? Well, and this could backfire on Comic-Con, right? It's Lionsgate and Studio Partners, which is a good sign. But if Lionsgate is, oh, no, we can't put our most popular stuff on that Comic-Con channel, and it turns into like kind of a second-rate thing, then it makes Comic-Con look bad. 
Sure, sure, absolutely. All right, uh, DirecTV has added 22 new live channels to its streaming app. If you subscribe to DirecTV, you can now bring a total of 90 live channels anywhere you go. Is it worth the money you pay for DirecTV to get 90 live streaming channels? Kind of similar to the Xbox One conversation. Dude, I'll tell you what, I would not have thought it's worth it. So originally I had predicted, and I've talked to, you know, about this, this fig leaf of a fake, you know, uh, cable company uh, in order to get streaming access for everything. But live channels, it's amazing to me how much my kids are, are watching the hell out of, out of Disney. So I, I'm going to say it's probably overpriced. And, it, you know, if that's all you want, there's cheaper ways to go about it. Of course, that's what our whole show's about. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to say it's probably a good thing and worth doing. What about if you're you? already a direct TV subscriber, certainly. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. I, I don't find myself taking advantage of it ever. Oh, Because really? I'm always oh, wanting to watch man. something on demand, not when it's live. The kid, now, keep in mind, our house, we only have one cable-attached television in the entire house. So, if, you know, if the kids are in the room, they're going to use their own devices. Amazon will join Netflix in streaming shows in high dynamic range later this year, which delivers much more vibrant colors to HDR-capable HDR sets. It's too early to care now, but, Tom, will you care in the next year? You know... HDR is one of those things where you just want to dismiss it as marketing hype, right? Oh, great. You're not selling enough 4K or 3D TVs, so you came out with HDR. But they really do look better. It's the kind of thing where you look at 4K and you're like, wow, that's impressive. Lots of resolution. You look at HDR and you're like, whoa. It's like when they turn the brightness all the way up. I kind of feel like this might sell probably more than it deserves. And Amazon and Netflix are smart to be out in front of it. Yeah, uh, I'll take an extension on this. Uh, uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, one of my best friends from high school is now like a vice president over at a major company in Hollywood. And uh, he uh, talked to me candidly about how uh, when 4K was what they were pushing and 3D was what they were pushing, 3D was, was ended up being a bad play because the at-home experience was not very good, but it was a right play insofar as it was fundamentally different from all the other televisions. You knew when you were seeing something 3D. 4K, unfortunately, is a matter of slightly increased fidelity. And once you're you know, more than 10 feet away from your television set, it's very difficult to tell the difference unless you have a gigantic TV. HDR, however... The moment you go to one of those tech demos, people are like, I get it. I can sell this. That is brighter than I've ever seen. That is darker than I've ever seen. It's, it's like there's a window, and it's a fundamentally different uh, experience that I'm having. So uh, I, I would say, number one, it's a smart play for uh, marketers and, and promoters because it is something that you can't show. You can't even simulate on current televisions. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, you know, high high frame rates and, um, uh, you know, increased resolution are just more of the same that you got. This is truly something different. Yeah, I agree. <sighs> got some bad news, Brian. Uh Oh, what's up? Fox will no longer put out box sets of seasons of The Simpsons on either DVD or Blu-ray. Um, they said maybe we'll put out a master set once the show is done running, whenever that happens. Uh, but this is the end of the physical disc. Well, I mean, first of all, it's it's overdue, right? <laughs> this is this has been coming for a long time. Uh, I I I am curious now that we live in an age where you're able to get uh, runoff uh, or one-off copies of books printed on demand. Why wouldn't you? It seems to me like the expensive part is getting the actors and the producers and the directors to sit down and run their mouths mouths off for a bit. And once you've done that. Why wouldn't you make this available? I mean, well, I'm no, sure this those things will still be made available either through the FX Now app or with the extras on your digital copies. I got all the DVD extras on my digital copies, Guardians of the Galaxy and Star Wars and everything. Sure, sure, sure. This sure. is basically but, saying we are not going to press the little plastic discs of these things anymore. But but I guess but nowadays like uh, even if only 300 people want them, you, you throw it up on Etsy or, or or Lulu or whatever. I mean, it's just like you know, just print them on demand. Who cares? It's they're like, just they're, I, they're what they're saying. That, that's why I think this is so significant. Fox is saying with their most beloved jewel that they launched FXX with, uh, not worth it. 
Not worth making. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, moving right along. The Verge had a nice write-up on something most of us will never experience. Prima Cinema, P-R-I-M-A Cinema, uh, allows you to stream in-theater movies at home. All you need is a little bit of uh, $35,000 for a device that'll stop working if you move it and requires a thumbprint, thumbprint scan in order to work. And the movies are only $500 each. Now, here's the thing, Tom. Uh, this oh, is you the have kind to, of thing. You also have to prepay for 10 of them. So you, you've got to pay $5,000 right out of the gate. Too. Granted, this is not for you and me. But if you're the kind of person that can afford this, this is a great solution. This does I, all like, like, yes, the DRM is overly restrictive, unnecessarily so. That's just as much for them to convince their pro partners that this isn't going to bite them in the butt. Uh, and also to kind of, it enhances the exclusivity for the people who actually have the, the coin to buy this kind of thing. I'm going to take an extension on this. Uh, Brian, I think this is a great day. Having an in-theater running movie in your home used to be only the province of the insanely rich who could afford to pay for an actual print to be delivered from the theater to their home projector that their manservant would thread and run <laughs> for him and his family. Now, through modern technology, we have brought that same experience to the super rich so that someone who has sold a company can now enjoy the same experience. Uh, okay, you are mocking as you say that. However, remember, it's trends... It's not where we're at. It's where we're headed. And this is actually, I think, we are seeing actual momentum in the democratization of bringing the uh, day-and-date release experience to everybody. Uh, Ten years from now, everyone's going to have this. Listen, man, uh, that was that was double-edged satire there because, yes, while I was mocking, I was also real. Like, we have – this is not new, right? It's not – the significant thing here isn't that you can watch an in-theater movie in your home. People right. have been able to do that. They just had to be really well connected and re or really wealthy or both. Now right. they just have to be wealthy, <laughs> right? Right? No, I, I and 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 it's like you know it's you know we're gonna say it with a, with a sly grin, but I actually I think this is great. Uh, and congratulations, prices come down, uh, Brian. Moderately rich people. <laughs> yeah, prices come down. That's what happens. Uh, this is going to be the thing that you look back on once everybody has these boxes in 50, 100 years, right? And it becomes just a normal thing. And you're like, God, wow, way back in the 20 teens, people actually had to pay $35,000, which was a lot of money back then, well, uh, and scan their way. thumbprints. What we're seeing is we are seeing, um, uh, in many ways, if you make a, you know, we'll say a middle-class income in America, then most of the technology that you use has been subsidized by the previous generations of it, in which case they were buggier, they worked you know, worse, they were bigger and clunkier, and people overpaid outrageous amounts. But that subsidy, you know, that subsidizes the research to make it universally available to everyone. And that's what we're seeing right now. Yes, yeah. this is outrageous and disgusting. Uh, also, the people who are doing it now you will thank them five years from now when you have a similar unit that's only $1,000 that you're able to have at home. Well, and the other part is uh, they're always the most restrictive on the things that the, when they can do the least amount of damage, right? How many right. people are going to – really, the $35,000 is all the protection you need Correct. on this. But yeah. they put the thumbprint scanner and they make the thing like if you move it, there's an accelerometer in there and it'll just disable itself. Uh, by the time it comes down in price and becomes and they've worked out all the problems with the theater owners. I know a bunch of people in the chat room are like theater owners never stand for this. That's the hurdle that they will eventually overcome somehow. Uh, and then they'll be like, ah, we don't really need to put a th thumbprint scanner. That just gets in the way of people renting the movie. Uh, and it'll become so much more easy to use eventually. But you're right. You're absolutely right. This is, th this is the beginning of that happening. Yeah. Hey, man, you want to see what's under surveillance? Whoa. Uh, let me look. It's all about location, location, location. Under surveillance. I mentioned my digital copies of Star Wars. Star Wars is available digitally now. It is the special editions, the most recent special editions. Uh, they did add some new featurettes to the various editions, as well as the old Blu-ray featurettes that you could get on the disc. They are $20 each or $90 for the bundle, at least for now. Uh, everything but A New Hope is available through Disney Movies Anywhere. So if you buy it on Vudu, iTunes, or Google Play, all of the movies except A New Hope will show up on all the other services. However, A New Hope is in the Ultraviolet universe because it's owned by Fox. So if you buy all of these at Vudu, you get 
five of the six movies on Vudu, Apple, and Google Play, and then you get A New Hope on Vudu and Cinema Now and Flickster. Is this a little bit like when the Beatles finally came to, uh, uh, to iTunes, where it's like that was sort of by being the last ones in the room, uh, they essentially are, are performing the coronation of the new standard, right? Yeah, I kind of think so. I, I, I'm trying to think. I know there are a few other movies out there that aren't available digitally, but this does feel that way. It feels like, yes, the Beatles digital collection is now available. So, you know, anything that's not out now is behind. Yeah, well, and meanwhile, all of us are just going to have to sit watching our despecialized editions until finally they release the original prints. Uh, oh, yeah, in I've still got format. my DVD of A New Hope that with the original, like, crappy print of the theater run where Han shoots decidedly first and everything. Yeah. Uh, and I will not let go of that. But I, I still bought these because I'm insane. Uh, no, ain't nothing wrong with that. Look, uh, uh, granted, we've all heard, um, you know, uh, we've, we've all heard Hey Jude a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I want to buy all the versions of it that I can. And, well, and here's the other thing. I, I, I want to add this. I don't want to go too long in this, but I did the pre-order through Vudu. And at, at 9 p.m. on Thursday night, midnight Eastern time. Just a switch flipped and it was suddenly I turned available. on my Apple TV and five of the six movies were there. That's like fantastic. That. Yeah, uh, I'm, oh, that's great. That's great. Look, and then, uh, and then all, all six were on Voodoo. I immediately went to my Roku and went to Voodoo and was like, oh, yep, yeah, there they are. Uh, though, oh, there is a controversy, though, because in Everything But A New Hope, they don't play the 20th Century Fox fanfare music. Oh. So that's going to happen in the theater with we'll Star let go Wars of Force that. Awakens. We'll let go of that. Would it be great if they did like a copyright-free version of that fanfare? Uh, they created their own studio called 20 is a big number studio. It's like just <laughs> yeah. a note off like partway through. A uh, bunch of Netflix stuff coming. New Orange is the new black trailer out. Season three of that arrives June 12th. Grace and Frankie, uh, starring Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin, Martin Sheen, and Sam Waterston, is coming to Netflix May 8th. And, of course, Daredevil came out this week. Dude, uh, Netflix continues to just kill it, slay it, they, and bury the bodies in the desert. I mean, it's amazing. And something uh, for everybody, right? Grace and Frankie is targeting, like, a much older demo than uh, than Orange is the New Black. Dude, which, or... which, which, by the way, I think is is the smart play because finally, I mean, it took a while to get there, but my parents are just this year, like they've had Netflix for like four years and they they have a PlayStation 3 attached to it. They don't ever play any games, but that's just their Netflix streaming device. They've never watched anything on Netflix. They only had it for the kids, uh, for my kids when they came to visit. But just now they're telling me about all these television shows that they've discovered and were able to binge on uh, on Netflix. So I think this is uh, the right time. I think that it's percolated up the chain to the uh, to the grandparent set. And by the way, if you don't know what Grace and Frankie is about, uh, Martin Sheen and Sam Waterston are married to Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin, but Martin Sheen and Sam Waterston's characters are in love with each other and their law partners, and they decide to leave their wives for each other. It's very progressive. It is. It's very Lily Tomlin, Martin Sheen, Sam Waterston, and Jane Fonda. Uh, <laughs> True Detective returns June 21st to HBO, now a cord-cutting option. Colin Farrell and Taylor Kitsch star as California Highway Patrolman. Rachel McAdams stars as a law enforcement officer who doesn't get along with him. And Vince Vaughn is the career criminal. I cannot be more excited about this. I was really it blown away by True Detective uh, first season. I love the fact that uh, much like a uh, much like uh, Quentin Tarantino has become a brand unto himself, and you don't expect every uh, movie to be you know in the same universe. Although there's hints that they may be, um, uh, I, I think it's great. I, I think it's great that they're that they're allowing. It's it's weird that it took us 30 years in America to get comfortable. For, with with the the Mexican institution of telenovelas, like we finally have become comfortable with the idea that a story can have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and next year you'll get a totally different story. Yeah, uh, and Entertainment Weekly says an Agents of Shield TV spinoff is being developed by Shield executive producer Jeffrey Bell, as well as Shield writer Paul Spachewski. And that's all they know. They don't know what characters would come over from Agents of Shield. They don't know what the plot's going to be. They hear that elements of the new show will show up later this season in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but there won't be like an in-season pilot or anything like that. Uh, so they don't really know much. So here's the part that's interesting to me is that they're framing it, and I understand why you would give that headline, we're seeing an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. spinoff, but really that's not the story at all. The story is we are getting 
a new Marvel Cinematic Universe story that happens to be on broadcast television. And like, what's amazing to me is that the fact that it's on broadcast television is like, oh yeah, no, I guess that's a deal. Uh, whatever. I mean, you know, it'd be just as fine as if it was on Netflix. And of course, we'll talk about Daredevil. But it's like, I, I, I don't know how interesting to me that they're calling it a spinoff of this property, but really anything they do is going to be part of this existing, you know, uh, cohesive meta narrative. The modern Marvel universe. Exactly. I mean, I guess the only thing that the spinoff phrasing tells you is some characters that are in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. will probably show up uh, as, as regular characters, you know, sort of like when the Flash went to Arrow uh, or you know, when Flash came out of Arrow. Anyway, although no characters, regular characters from Arrow went to Flash. It was an in-season pilot there. And But, but no, you're right. It, it's just another Marvel show is coming out is, is really what's exciting about it. And frankly, I watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on Hulu more often than even over the air. We record it on the TiVo. And, I, that and that's how I used to watch it. But so often, Eileen's watching something on the TiVo from over the air that I end up just going in the other room, launching the Roku or the Apple TV, and 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 watching that Hulu show, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, dude, great news. Uh, what are you watching these days, Tom? Well, I watched the season finale of Archer, and I really enjoyed this season. Uh, it's not my favorite season overall, but I think it was an improvement from last season. Uh, there is also a twist at the end. What a surprise. And I'm curious uh, where that takes us or if it takes us or if it's just a fake out for next by, year. By the way, uh, real quick, uh, you know, now that that season is totally done, I, I think for whatever reason, Archer sits with me best, much like South Park. You know, when I sit down and burst it all at once. So maybe over the next week, I'll watch all of those and we can talk oh, about that'd it. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, of course, I'm watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, and I find this, uh, we, we've we come down from the Captain America high of last year, but it is definitely not as low as it was before that high. So it's chugging along well. I actually really enjoy it. And I'm very curious to see what happens the week Age of Ultron comes out. Uh, I watched the finale of Better Call Saul, and we'll talk about that in Spoiler in Time. Uh, I watched the first episode of Daredevil, which we'll also talk about in Spoiler in Time, as well as the S.H.I.E.L.D. episode 5 of season 5. And last night, Eileen and I just turned on uh, YouTube over Chromecast and watched the Coachella live stream. So much better than being there in the mud and the dirt. We could just be on a couch playing Hearthstone. Listening yeah, to some but the tunes. only difference, I, I, you, you have to have uh, Eileen simulate that the chick next to you is high on ecstasy and starts rubbing your chest. <laughs> Just you, you have, to, you have to walk her through that. <laughs> we actually just got some whiskey and sat there. <laughs> right on. That's how uh, we did, Coachella. What have you been watching? A lot of the same stuff. Obviously, it's a shorter week uh, because we're recording this on a Saturday. But uh, last night and the night before, I poked in and started watching bits and pieces of uh, of Atari Game Over, which was just awesome. I mean, it's like uh, I only got halfway through it, but but the it's such a bigger story than some guys who love video games wanted to dig up, you know, trash in the desert and confirm, you know, it, it the pitch for it sounds like a Mythbusters episode, but as you watch the documentary, it's about so much more. It's about it's about the unreality of the amount of money that they were making in the early 80s at this time. It's about the unfairness of this programmer who had nothing, was batting a thousand, nothing but successes, millions of dollars being made on every game he made. And he was just told, hey, can you whip out E.T. in five weeks? And he was like, sure, that's what I've done for everything else. And uh, seeing like that guy now is a, a psychotherapist, like he's not he's out of the game world and basically he talks video game nerds through their issues. It's great. And, and it was an utter delight to see people that I know in person just pop up on there. Like it was a total surprise. I knew Ernie Klein was in there and it was great to see George R. R. Martin show up, uh, with, you know, who I've never met. Uh, but, but when Gary Witta suddenly shows up with his commentary, it was delightful. I'm really digging it. And in fact, um, well, if you watch it this next week, I'll finish it up and maybe we can Where talk do you about watch it next it? week. What's up? Where do you watch it? Uh, Netflix. Netflix, Netflix. So, folks, go to your local Netflix. Yeah, I'm going to try to watch it by next week. Uh, coming out this weekend in the theaters, if you're interested in watching what you want in a chair somewhere else in another building, Paul Blart, Mall Cop 2, which, by the way, is a guy from Queens in the movie draft uh, movie, and Unfriended, uh, which is that entirely shot on laptops and phones uh, movie movie horror movie uh, about 
uh, somebody hijacking a dead person's social networks. Uh, I'll tell you what. I actually have a uh, a real feeling about. I'm going to draft.diamondclub.tv uh, to take a look at what what Frog Pants paid for it. Uh, I suspect, yeah, Frog Pants paid thirteen dollars. Maybe that's still a little high, but I, I think uh, that's going to be a bit of, of a surprise. I think Unfriended is going to do really well. I think it has a chance to be a uh, um, paranormal activity slash, you know, uh, 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 what's the running around in the woods with the cameras one Blair Witch uh, Project Blair Witch yeah Blair, oh, Blair Witch, Witch kind of surprise <laughs> alright and we will uh, go into more of the movie draft in the spoiler in time episodes right now it's time for some dispatches from the front hey Tom yeah Nick writes in he says hey employees quick question here I'd sure, like to awesome. get into the Breaking Bad universe, and I'm wondering, as someone that's only ever seen the pilot of Breaking Bad, should I watch Breaking Bad first? Or since Better Call Saul is a prequel, should I watch that first? Uh, that's from Nick. I would say from a practical point of view, if you did want to do it that way, it's going to take you, you know, five years to watch the prequel first. And which, by the way, I'm still convinced will not necessarily stay a prequel. I'm convinced it'll come into the future. Uh, I, I would say experience the whole journey the way we have because we're perfect and awesome and you deserve to be as perfect and awesome as us. Look, listen, as perfect and awesome as we are, Vince Gilligan is from a higher plane. Vince Gilligan determined to make Breaking Bad first, then better call Saul. In his infinite wisdom, do you want to question Vince Gilligan, Vince, Nick? He decided. So it was decided. <laughs> and uh, when Vince he, gave to us Breaking Bad. In the uh, no, in, in all seriousness, I think... You should watch them in the order they were aired. Uh, I think it would be interesting to see someone once better call. Once we know whether this UFO future where Saul settles the moon is the actual ending of <laughs> Better Call Saul or not, uh, I I, th I think then it might be interesting to to maybe watch them out of order or something. But I I think it's best to start with Breaking Bad. Yeah, I agree. Steve wrote in. He's got a longer email here, but I'm going to summarize Steve if if you'll allow it. I apologize. Um, He's our boss down under, by the way, which I assume means Australia. He says, look, given those recent uh, Sling TV hiccups, what is people's perception of downtime regarding streaming video? And he points out, like, with over the air, uh, unless there's a storm, you assume it's just always going to be up. With cable, every once in a while, you know, it might go out and you get really mad and you call the cable company and you're like, get it back. Uh, but with streaming video those of us who've been dealing with it for a long time kind of expect it to occasionally buffer or go out or have to reload. Uh, so he, he just asked the question, you know, uh, quality and stability are even more vital given the events themselves are a major reason for purchasing services like Sling TV. Ha will our expectations go that way as well? Well, here's the other thing is it's not just a question of the reliability of your connection and how long it goes out and how often. I suspect that another factor, because... Uh, up until now, there was just live television, right? And live meant, you know, within five or six seconds, it was happening as it happens or, you know, especially on sporting events. But now that we live in a world and, and you know, that was right insofar as it was because it wasn't like anyone could call you from the football game and tell you, you know, what the play was before it actually showed up on television. But nowadays in a world where it's like Twitter, people will tweet who are there at the event and you can get that information a good 20 seconds before it shows up on your stream. Uh, I, I wonder if that's going to, if latency will become a premium that people care more about. And for example, we're a prime, you know, target of it right here on diamondclub.tv. We spend about a thousand dollars a year on hosting just so we can have a three to four second latency connection through Meta CDN so that we're able to have real time communication as opposed to, you know, with the, with the chat room, as opposed to like twitch.tv where, you know, there's 30 second lag between what happens on screen and when people react to it. Yeah, I think for big events like the Super Bowl, the NCAA Final Four, latency might rear its ugly head and people start to bitch about it. I think for everyday life, though, there's even bigger problems. And those are the problems of, I just want to watch the show right now. I want to watch it on demand. It isn't even live. Why can't it stream? And there, it could be a massive number of people. Like, more people than ever are going to be watching shows at the same time. You, you think that the Game of Thrones premiere on HBO Go was big. Game of Thrones premiere tomorrow 
which already may have happened, is going to be ridiculous on yeah. the internet. Uh, and and preparing for that many people requiring that much data all at once is something the internet really hasn't done before. This is all new territory. So there's so many ways that your stream can break down from the servers to the transit provider to the interconnections to your ISP to your router to, you know like the list goes on and I'm oversimplifying it uh, it's kind of amazing when you think about it that any video streams to you at all uh, so I think this is a really relevant question in so many different ways from Steve about how much of a problem we're going to have and how tolerant are we going to be as a society of that sort of thing. By the way, I've said this before, and I'm surprised nobody's taken me up on it, so I'm just going to repeat my offer. If you want to be very popular instantly and also hated by everyone instantly, here's what you do. The, because HBO Go releases the episode on demand at the same time it shows live, so the moment it comes out, when the whole world's live tweeting and reacting to stuff for reals, load it up open up the episode, skip right to the last five minutes, figure out what the big spoiler at the end is, and just start loudly shouting it on your Twitter so that you can be first and then everyone will be mad at you. Uh, Andrew Zarian won't mind. Oh, yeah, no. Speaking of which, <laughs> Andrew Zarian came up uh, last week and had the, uh, the surprising opinion that he absolutely loves spoilers and he won't see anything unless he already knows how it's going to end. And uh, we thought that that was crazy. And then we got all these emails from people who are cut from the same cloth. We got this email from Steve that says, I thought I was the only one. After, pre after paying and seeing a terrible movie in 2007, sitting through an hour and a half to find out that he still dies. Uh, oh, yeah, spoiler alert. I won't say what movie it is. I seek out every movie and TV show plot before I invest my time watching it. I have sympathy for the, for, for the spoiler phobic and try not to spoil things for my friends and family. But personally, I'm not paying for something if I know I won't like the end. And he says nice things about the show, and he's a patron. Thank you. Byron uh, thank says, you, I tend to enjoy spoilers and never try to avoid them unless I know I'm about to see something soon anyway and would, of course, not seek out a show called Spoiler in Time if I was afraid of possible spoilers. I will admit, if it wasn't for you guys spoiling Breaking Bad every week on frame rate, I probably would not have taken the plunge to binge watch it at all, and I still greatly enjoyed it. Ryan Mercer says, employees, fellow owners, stop complaining about spoilers. If you don't like them, don't listen. I get tired of hearing about how we should have spoilers, shouldn't have spoilers. Oh, my God, we, we need to do this about spoilers. No, no, we need to do this. I don't listen to hear five to ten minutes of debating spoiler protocol weekly. Uh, and, and so there, there you go. Uh, I was shocked to see one of these. Uh, three of them kind of blew me away uh, as a representative sample of the audience. So those of you who are spoiler phobic, keep in mind there is another party in this election. Uh, but you know what? The spoiler, the spoiler philic people uh, do seem to generally be sensitive and not wanting to spoil the spoiler phobic people, which is good. Indeed. Uh, we got another email that says, my question is about Yahoo Screen and recent original programming. Big fan of community because of watching community on uh, Yahoo Screen. Stumbled across Sin City Saints, which appears to be another solid show. I see they're bringing in another show called Other Space. The thing is, Yahoo has been providing these shows without any visible commercials on the Roku or Apple TV apps. Is the plan a future subscription service? Is there something else going on? With some of this quality programming, I would hate to see it all vanish because they're not getting a return on their investment. Uh, first of all, I would say just because you're not seeing ads doesn't mean that there aren't ads available to be sold for those shows. It may be if you remember the real early days of Hulu, sometimes you'd get lucky and watch an episode and not get any ads because they just hadn't sold any. That may be going on with Yahoo Screen because it's much less popular. By the way, uh, that still happens. When I was watching The Prophet, uh, you would see the first th two or three ad breaks would be filled and there would be like obviously two more ad breaks, but there would just be no ads in them. Like, like yeah. they just ran out. They're like, just keep running it. And then uh, Yahoo Screen uh, is Yahoo's gamble to try to make money off this. And, uh, you know, Yahoo has all kinds of financial problems. We could go all day in an entirely different show about uh, the issues that Yahoo and the challenges that Yahoo is facing. But, but their gambling here is that you'll come for community and stay for the other things, and that will build up enough views that they'll be able to sell the ads. So uh, it is a gamble. 
So real quick, uh, before we wrap up, uh, there was an email from Bill about uh, being able to track down what the free game of the day was on MLB.tv. It looks like you had an answer for that, Tom. So part, Partly. What Bill wants to know is, is there a way to get an alert when his favorite team is the free game of the day? He's near Athens, Georgia. So I'm, this, And Bill, I apologize if this is not right, but for the sake of example, let's say it's the Atlanta Braves. When the Atlanta Braves are the one free game of the day, whoever they're playing, he'd like an alert to say, hey, Braves are the free game. You can watch them today because he doesn't want to have to pay for MLB.tv. Uh, part of the problem is that uh, he, oh, I'm sorry. I said the Atlanta Braves, and he says right here in the email he's a Cubs fan. I have a block on people who admit to that, so that may be part of it. Uh, it's The problem is he lives in Athens, Georgia. He gets WGN America, but not all the Cubs games are on WGN America anymore, so he wants to be able to watch them when they're on the MLB free TV. Okay, anyway, long story short, MLB.com slash Media Center has all of the games and it highlights free game of the day. Uh, far as I can tell, the best you could do is come up with some sort of script that checks that page, looks for free game of the day, looks for Chicago Cubs, and then sends you alert, an alert somehow. Uh, I did not find anything that automatically tells you what the free game of the day is. And I, I think that would be something for MLB to do. I, they have a, a game of the day uh, Twitter, but they phrase the game description differently every time. So it's kind of hard uh, to create an alert based on that. Interesting. Uh, right on, man. By the way, uh, all of your feedback, thank you so much for keeping it coming. It's uh, cordkillers at gmail.com. Oh, yeah. I meant to say, if you know of a solution or if you've created a solution for Bill, send it to cordkillers at gmail.com. You can find us on the web, cordkillers.com, and you can be a Patreon at patreon.com slash cordkillers. Brian, anything else? Man, that's it. I, 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 let's, let's get to the spoiler in time. We'll see you there. Hey guys, Tom and Brian here. We just wanted to say thank you to all of our $5 patrons who keep us loud, live, and independent. You guys make Court Killers the production that it is. Your name appears in the video credits and appears in our hearts. And if you'd like to become one of them or see who they are, you can go to patreon.com slash court killers. You'll need to do more than just go there though. You'll have to sign up and you know pledge an amount. But Unless you just want to see who they are. Well, I mean, you can gawk. That's a little creepy, isn't it? If you want to be a gawker, let's go. Up to you. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>